Hey, hey. All right. Well, that was riveting. Let's have some fun. Okay. So if you've been in private equity for 10 years, or you're on your second fundraise, or you're an attorney, or something like that, you might be pretty bored. This is pretty basic. So this is not for you. But if you're getting ready to embark on your journey of your first fundraising, then this is for you. Okay, so let's dive right in, or try to. Okay, the Venture Galaxy, the final frontier. We got a lot of different people up here, and not everybody understands what all these people do. Okay, so like in real estate, it's all about location, and here, it's all about people. So let's just take a quick spin through this galaxy and see what we have here. Okay, so we have limited partners, right? Often called LPs. That's where most of the money comes from, okay? And in the world of limited partners, you have institutions, high net worth individuals, entrepreneurs, uh, family offices, sovereign wealth funds, all of these kind of people and they give that money to the venture capitalists, also called general partners, or GPs for short, okay? These are the capital allocators, okay? These are the ones that actually invest the money. And you have a lot of different types of flavors here too. You have micro VCs, you have seed focused, late stage focused, sector focused, maybe they only focus on biotech or Bitcoin startups, okay? And um, it's important to know that the VCs don't make any money until they return money back to the LPs. And this whole cycle continues, okay? There's also another type of uh, VC that's not listed up here, and that's a corporate VC. Okay, what's a corporate VC? That's inside of a, inside of a corporation, they have their own venture arm, and they invest in companies. Why does that matter? Well, a lot of times as a startup, you might think that your biggest competition is another startup, but it might actually be a VC inside a corporation is an intrapreneur where they invest in things that they look back on and say, do we build it or buy it? And what happens if you're a founder and you grant all sorts of information rights and other things to a corporate VC that you then have to change? Just something to think about. What else do we have here? Accelerators, incubators, studios, lots of different words for the same type of thing. They're often before the venture capitalists and very early. And they're meant to pour fuel on these young founders and companies, sometimes even starting companies themselves and being very involved with them, okay? We have angel investors who usually invest very early and they're investing their own money. That's very important to note, is angel investors are investing their own money, a lot of individuals, former operators, tech executives, um, all that good stuff. Finally, we have founders, and we have the teams, and the talent that they attract, and the customers, way on the other end of it. And these are a bunch of people that you will meet on your journey. Okay, so, I only have a few minutes here and they're gonna cut me off for sure. But there are a few things to know. However, these are pretty boring things and there's only uh, so much time and we wanna have fun, but we should at least touch on them a little bit. Okay, incorporation types, geographies, all that stuff matters. Are you a Delaware C? Are you gonna incorporate in Dubai? Do you have multiple corporations in different jurisdictions with different licenses? Maybe it's a matrix. Maybe you have all sorts of things that you'll have to think about. And why? Because if you do it wrong, you will have to redo it. It is possible. Okay, cap tables, options pools. Do you, does it matter how many people are on your cap table? Is it okay that there's 100 people on there? Did you create a sufficient options pool for your first hires and those engineers and people that you're gonna have to give away equity to? Who gets diluted? We'll find out. Not today, though, for another time. All right, what's in your data room? Who do you share it with? When do you share it? Okay, does that matter? Does it set you up looking like a badass founder when you have a data room that is complete and thorough with everything in there? From wiring instructions to your cap table, executive summaries, go-to-market plans. Oh, my. You should certainly have a data room. 
and you should have a clicker. Types of instruments, safes, equity, debt, how do they convert? How much of the company are you gonna own with these future financing rounds? Are you making calculations? Do you properly understand this? All things that you're gonna have to know. Term sheets, wires, and signatures, oh my. The term sheets is an alphabet soup, all right? It's a lot of fun, but there's a lot of sneakily sort of things that can happen in there. And then retaining counsel. Everybody's seen My Cousin Vinny. It's a great movie. Thankfully, the two Utes got off at the end of the movie, but this is not what you want to do with your attorney for your startup, okay? Uh, why? Well, first off, um, your brother who's a divorce attorney or your neighbor who's a litigator, they probably don't know terms that are kind of standard uh, in the industry and they're likely to end up fighting over things they don't know anything about. And then what that's going to do is it's going to frustrate the hell out of the other side. Because as a founder, it might only be your first or second time raising money, but the VCs do this all the time. And what kind of a red flag does this send up? Okay. It sends up a red flag that if at this point in time in your career, you cannot identify the proper service providers to simply close your first round of funding, what's gonna happen when you embark on the rest of your journey? Okay, this is what we're thinking. Another note on lawyers, you know, not one size fits all. There are attorneys that will help close a big financing round. There are attorneys that will negotiate, negotiate your corporate contracts, okay, which will actually make or break your business. And these are different attorneys, okay? So you, as Phil Jackson for the 1995 Bulls, need to put everyone in the right place and use them properly. All right, let's get rolling. All right, so there's no, oh my God, five minutes left, get real. All right, friends and family, let's go, let's go, let's go. Okay, so friends and family, experience, they don't have much. Likely they cannot help you with your Bitcoin startup, okay? There's not too much that Aunt Mary, Uncle Bob, the old college roommate, okay? They can't do a lot, all right? They don't know too much. And that's great because you're asking them for money. So it's great that they don't know anything. This is not likely to be a complex negotiation, okay? They're like, well, they hear buzzwords, angel investment, cousin Nick, $20 million. Wow, this sounds great, let's get in on the ground floor. But they likely don't have much money, okay? But what they have, you can get really fast because they don't wait around. It's, it's the most common, quickest way that you can start shaking some shekels and getting some money into your uh, startup. And they're very flexible because they don't know what they're doing. So what are they gonna fight with you about? And they're likely not to invest again okay so a positive wild card no matter how tight you are with your VC or your angel investors there is no chance that they will ever replace your closest friends your family those people that you've known forever they can give you support that you will never get from any advisor or anyone else and it can ruin your life and it can ruin the friendships with those people. And it's a great way to have awkward Thanksgiving dinners, okay? And a lot of terrible misunderstandings when they don't know what they're really investing in and then you have to um, live with them. So, something to keep in mind. And the score there was 21 for our little uh, score here. So then we have angel investors, right? Um, experience, they can do a lot. Uh, you know, your mileage may vary. Uh, Depending on who you get, an angel investor can really do a ton for your business. Remember, they're investing their own money, okay? And they certainly have more than Aunt Mary and Uncle Bob, which is great. Um, they're not as quick, because they know a little bit more, so they usually have a few more questions. Uh, but they do move fairly quickly. I mean, a serious angel investor will invest quickly. Okay, and there's some flexibility, certainly there, with terms and timing and pro rata and other things. Um, and future funding is not that likely. Uh, it's, not, it's not always the case, but most of the time, I wouldn't expect to receive follow-on rounds from individual angels. Venture capitalists, okay, now we're talking, right? This is the holy grail, this is what everyone wants. They have a lot of experience. They can really do a lot for your business. Um, potentially, maybe they have too much experience, 
okay? Um, and they have all the money, but they move very slow, and that's not a good thing. Um, they are very likely to invest again, often when you even don't want them to, okay? And that would be if they enforced their pro rata rights on you, which is something you really do have to think about. And they're not very flexible. This is actually your first real negotiation, okay? This is when you have real terms, control, uh, depending on if it's a Series A, you might be giving up a board seat. Okay, and the wild card, they're very powerful, they can do a lot for you, and they can be very controlling. All right, accelerators definitely can do a lot, right? This is a boot camp. They're gonna teach you a lot of that stuff that's on the PSA. Um, they're gonna introduce you to capital networks. Um, again, your mileage may vary, right? You could have a great accelerator experience or you could have a meaningless accelerator experience. But this often come, this also comes with a capital infusion from the accelerator. They're going to invest their money into your startup and then they're gonna take a percentage, their interests are aligned, and depending on how well you utilize them, they can be a great help for you. Um, the speed is not very high because you have to apply, you have to get accepted. They have timed cohorts where you can't always necessarily get in. And then once you get in, you have to spend, you know, a couple of months in that accelerator back to school doing a bunch of work. Future funding, they don't, most of the time, don't invest in follow-on rounds. Wildcard, you can get a whole bunch of FOMO. Oh my God, it's the hottest name in this company and that company. You get all this kind of FOMO that comes along, which is nice. And then, of course, the negative is you're back in school, and that might not really be something that you're interested in. Um, but you will learn a ton. Okay, syndicates, well, that's my favorite. Now, if angel investors were helpful on their own as individuals, syndicates are groups of angel investors, okay? That's what we focus on at Lightning Ventures, okay? So when you get a whole motley crew of these angel investors together investing in a deal, you never know what you're gonna get, right? You never know who's gonna be in there. Definitely a good amount of capital. Now this depends on, of course, the time and the market. Right now is not a great time. Uh, but you can, you can raise a lot of money from syndicates, especially if you do it properly. Speed, this is based on where we're at with the market right now, and that speed is not too fast. Uh, these deals are taking longer, but that's just where it is right now, not always. Um, there's not too much flexibility, uh, and the future funding is likely because syndicates wanna keep investing in companies that are doing well. That's part of their model. The wild card is there can be a turbo boost, right? Your speed can go super fast. You can have a syndicate deal that fills in a couple hours and you can raise 500,000 or $700,000 for your company. That is possible. Um, and then you could have mixed results because maybe you decided to go to some not great Web3 syndicate, okay? And maybe they don't understand your business and can't really do anything to help you. Crowdfunding, not even gonna spend time here because I'm actually nearly out of time. Um, but remember Aunt Mary and Uncle Bob? Um, now you've got like 3,000 of them and they invested like $30 in your business, okay? So that's really what happens here with crowdfunding. Depending on where you're at with your company, like Julian from Relay, if you have a very recognizable brand that a lot of people in a country like, then it can be great to throw this out there to your like core audience, you know what I mean? And get them involved in investing in your company. Um, but a lot of times, it's a big waste of time, okay? And... All right, almost done, I promise. All right, so first off, what is your target goal? How much money do you wanna raise and what are you planning to do with it? Okay, that's the most important thing, okay? I personally am an advocate of milestone-based financing, okay? This shifts the dynamic to basically raise what you need to get to that next level. Is it 5,000 downloads? Is it 10,000 downloads? Is it paid users? Whatever you're looking at, raise just enough to get to that point, okay? It focuses on progress. Um, define what you want, aligned values. When you write an email to an, to an angel investor or a VC, personalize it, okay? Personalize it. Don't come at it like a transaction. Okay, we're raising two million on a six million pre and na 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 na. That's how everyone comes at you, okay? That's not cool. Make it personal. 
what are you doing? Start, start there, all right? It's a relationship. It can develop over time, even if they don't invest. Even if they don't invest in your company. They're, it's not saying that they won't one day, okay? These things take forever, all right? And you should treat it that way. Don't just blindly buy some VC list and just spam everybody. Don't e email biotech people about your Bitcoin company. Don't email late stage people when you're in a pre-seed round, okay? Um, ask, ask other founders for intros and help. Ask Julian, if you know him, from Relay, who's went through a number of successful fundraises. Ask him, because he knows the pain that you are going through and he will sympathize with you. He will be able to let you know things that worked for him, things that didn't. And every founder that I know, the minute they think they're gonna raise money, they just start reaching out to VCs. Reach out to other founders. Try to get a double opt-in intro. Try to get two people separately to, to send an intro email to a VC because it, it totally works, okay? Finally, life is short, all right? Life is too short to work with people who you don't trust, who don't have your best interest, who don't have your back, who don't build you up, okay? It's too short, right? My life is too short and your life is too short. So think about that because nobody's money is actually that good, okay? It doesn't matter, all right? And finally, I mean, the, when the lights go out for all of us at the end of it all, the sum total of our positive experiences is all that matters. So just think about that when you decide to take money from someone. And that's it. Okay. Give it up for Muzz.